Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Independent Consulting 101 course, part two. Uh, my name is Daniel Lay. And I'm Ellen McInerney. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to talk about setup. So let's just jump right into it. So in this slide, we have the setup timeline, and it's really based on my experience. And it goes from when I first started setting up the company all the way to when I got my first invoice. So at the top of the chart, you'll have the different months. And right underneath that is the expenses and costs that were incurred in that month. And then below the chart, you'll see a running total and then more details about the different expenses that were incurred in that month. So starting at the, at the beginning in month one, it was all about operational costs and legal costs. And it, most of it was the computer equipment that I had to get, but it was also all the legal fees and to set up the company from incorporating the state filings. So my legal fees were probably a little more than most because I was incorporated in Delaware. I live in Texas, so I had to file there as well. And then I was working at the time with my client in New York. So from there, going to month two is when I started talking to the client and starting contract negotiations. But before I did that, I actually drafted my own MSA and SOWs. And I went to a lawyer to review those and kind of cross the T's, dot the I's, make sure I had everything in place and help me throughout the contract negotiations and review all the red lines. So that happened in month two, and it really bleeded into month three. And month three, there wasn't really any cost except for the business insurance. I had to get that set up uh, to continue the, con the contractual proceedings. And then from there, it was just waiting on their approval and getting signatures from the CEO. Moving to month four, again, costs were just about $100, which is the insurance. And that's when I started the actual project and onboarding with the client. It was mostly remote, and I didn't travel until month five. So month five is when a lot of the costs start increasing because I had to travel to the client site. Um, and then I also bought a one-year subscription for WebEx um, so that I can conduct business when I was remote. So month five, uh, even though that was the second month of really working on the project, it's really when my first invoice was submitted. Uh, moving to month six, again, it really just travel costs and the insurance. Uh, submitted my second invoice, so I didn't actually get paid until month seven. So again, month seven, you can see the travel costs, the insurance, submitted my third invoice, and finally got paid for that first invoice that I submitted in month five. And Daniel, what have you found with clients? Do they typically pay within 30 days, 45 days? What's been kind of the standard for you? Yeah, it really depends. For clients that really have everything automated, it's pretty quick. Usually it's net 30, so you'll get paid within 30 days or within the next month. When you get into higher dollar amounts, there's more approval processes, more signatures, and the money tends to get held up in different places. The longest experience I've had was probably working four to five months without getting paid. But generally speaking, once you get, you have a relationship with the client, you have everything set up, it's more like clockwork. Yeah, that's Not sure if you've had the same experience. Yeah, it's been... It's been pretty, um, I think, anywhere from one to two months for me, but I think there's a difference too when you do a direct contracting relationship versus subcontracting because it's fewer people involved in the process. Absolutely. All right, moving to the next slide. Uh, lawyers. Going through the checklist, I would say the, the most important thing is do your own research to start. Lawyers will typically give you a free 30-minute session, and you really want to use that and extract the most value as possible and not use it as a learning session. So definitely research the things in our checklist and I'll go through these really quickly. So first, figure out the different entity types. So sole proprietorship, LLC, S Corp, C Corp. Really think through and research what those mean and what the differences are and what the pros and cons are. A ton of great articles online, um, definitely look that up so you at least understand the basics of these before you go speak to a lawyer. Take the time to think about your needs, You know how you wanna set up your company, uh, do you want agent representation? If you're using your own house address as your company address, maybe having a layer of protection between you and all the communications coming in. So agent representation may be something you want to think through. Look at the different state requirements and the federal requirements. I know personally, being incorporated in Delaware, living in Texas, working in New York, that's three different states with three different sets of rules. So definitely do some research there so you know what type of questions to ask around those restrictions and requirements when you talk to a lawyer. And that's something to consider too. They they learn the different state and federal requirements, but there may be some benefit in working with lawyers who have either you know had people with a similar situation in your specific state or having a lawyer that's local if you want to meet with them face to face. So certainly something to consider as you're making your decision. There you go. So when you're talking to a lawyer, uh, three different categories to think about: experience. Uh, do they have clients that are independent consultants as well? You know, it's good to understand if they have clients that are exactly in your same situation. Next is services and rates. 
do they offer everything that you're looking for from building the contracts, the SOWs, the MSAs, and it, are they in your budget? And that's why we recommend looking and interviewing three to five candidates so you can get kind of an understanding of what the average rate is. And finally, personal fit. You know, it's always good to, to be with someone that you're comfortable with. And uh, a lot of that can be determined in your face-to-face uh, interviewing process. All right. Ellen, do you want to jump into accounting? Absolutely. So I think in addition to hiring a lawyer, hiring an accountant is one of the most critical parts of the setup process. Before doing so, though, I think it's important to understand basic accounting. So I have a background in finance, which required a number of accounting classes. And I think, Daniel, you also have a background in finance as well. So I think that's a good starting point. But for people who try to do things themselves, um, this would not be an area that I recommend doing that. So if you aren't familiar with basic accounting, I would definitely get recommend getting comfortable with accounts receivable, accounts payable, understanding assets, liabilities, retained earnings. And then most importantly for our situation, understanding cash versus accrual accounting. So I would say most independents probably use a cash basis accounting, which is essentially where you recognize revenue and expenses when they're paid. And that just has to be, that is due to when we receive payments on invoices as as we had discussed with the setup timeline. So just certain things to be aware of going in, and I think it will help drive a more fruitful conversation as you interview accountants and get a better sense of you know, who's going to be a good fit for you and who can provide the services that you need. The next part of it, I would say, is understanding your accounting needs. So for me, a big component of this is setup guidance. Similar to a lawyer, there's a lot of state and federal rules and regulations. So I found that a bit challenging to navigate, and I also found it challenging as I interview, interviewed accountants and found someone who was a right fit to find someone who is truly organized and help me drive through that process. So I think that's something to consider throughout the process. Who's going to help you not only make sure things are um, completed on time to avoid fees, but having them actually drive you through that process to ensure that nothing's missed. Yeah, I, I couldn't iterate that more. I know my first accountant that I had, it was like a game of 23 questions. If I didn't ask the right question, I wouldn't get the right guidance. And that's the kind of the worst situation to be in when you're first starting and you don't really understand all the the nuances and details of bookkeeping and the accounting that you need to do. And I think that's where recommendations come in as well, asking people, letting them know what you're looking for and then asking them for recommendations. So I think you probably get what you pay for when it comes to accounting. So if you know someone who's gone through this process and didn't have a strong accounting background who needed that setup guidance, I would certainly ask them who they use for an accountant and do they recommend them. Other things to consider are bookkeeping. So I don't personally use any sort of bookkeeping, but I know a lot of people use QuickBooks. Daniel, is that a service that you're using? Yep. Uh, I did QuickBooks out of the gates. I would say it's great. You can link your bank account and your credit card to it. So then as you're running things, they can send those bookkeeping entries into that uh, application. It helps automate a few um, manual entries that you know you might not want to do, but something to think about. And I think too, you might be able to get that through your accountant at a discounted rate. I know I get payroll services through my accountant, so I am an LLC taxed as an S corp, and with that, I've had to actually produce paychecks when paying myself. So um, that's one of the things that I originally didn't know that I needed, but learned that through engaging with the accountant. So that's another service to consider as well. I pay about fifty dollars per month for that. And does that? payroll system, does it handle your taxes as well? Yep. So it will do the quarterly nine for one or sorry. Yeah. The quarterly nine for ones. And then I think there's also a nine forty. So yep. um, certainly not ta- or tax or accounting advice, but this has been helpful for me to work with my accountant to understand. So I'd highly recommend figuring out what you think your needs are and then having that conversation during these interviews. Yeah. And I just add to that. I originally, when I first started was doing all the payroll manually. So I literally wrote myself checks and then I went onto the site to pay all my taxes. And it was just another headache every month that I had to go through and every quarter. Um, and then this year I've actually gone through a payroll service and it's been so nice to just see the money appear in your bank account and just double check online to see if the taxes have been paid. It's been fantastic. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it as well. I'm certainly of the mindset of do it yourself. But after going through that process, if I were to start over, I would have just worked with accountant from day one and had them help with the setup and the payroll. I found that it's worth it. So then I think part two, so we talked about working with a lawyer to figure out the entity type. I think you also want to have that conversation with your accountant as well. So Um, From a legal aspect, there's going to be some considerations, but also from a tax component, it's important to have that conversation. So 
while you're either working with an accountant to hire them or once you've determined who your accountant is, I think that will be helpful. So for example, um, as I had mentioned, I'm LLC taxes S Corp. And the reason I made that decision is because you can do a one-time distribution at a reduced tax rate. And again, this may vary by state and your individual setup, but I found that to be beneficial for me. And had I not discussed it with my accountant, I wouldn't have known that that was a good option. And Daniel, your setup as a corporation, did you work with your accountant on that or was that more of a legal decision that you made? Yeah, the, the origins of choosing that was I actually watched a YouTube video from Stanford Business and they recommended all companies that eventually want to grow and expand, potentially get bought uh, to be a corporation first um, and then incorporate in Delaware. So that's originally why I chose that because I had these grand plans for the company um, and then decided to do an S Corp to start out so that I can have the same benefits as potentially an LLC. But I think that brings up a good point. There's a lot of resources online, whether it's YouTube or Google, your best bet is going to come in is to be coming in informed. So understand accounting, understand the laws, read as much as you possibly can in order to have an effective conversation with you with an accountant or a lawyer. So similar to hiring a lawyer, we included some questions in here that focus on experience, service and rates and personal fit. So there's going to be some overlap, but finding someone who has experience with your personal situation in an industry will be helpful as well as just do they have other clients that um, have a setup similar to your similar to yours, I think that will really set you up for success when working with an accountant. Um, understanding their service, their services that they offer as well as the cost. I think this was also a challenge for me. I didn't have a good sense of how much you should pay for an accountant. And I think the more people you interview, you'll get a better sense of you know, what the rates are and what you're going to get for that. Because I did find that that very wide, varied widely. I don't know if you had a similar experience, Daniel. They, they definitely have different service offerings and charge differently for it. Like some are more strategic while some are just more bookkeeping oriented. And it varies, I'm sure, by state and local pricing. So it's probably more in New York versus, say, Sugarland, Texas. Once you interview three to five candidates, you'll get an understanding of what that range will be. Absolutely. And I would say, too, finding someone that can accommodate all of your accounting needs, you'll find that you'll end up spending more if you're splitting services between multiple accountants. So really having an understanding going in of what your needs are and making sure that one person can satisfy that as opposed to working with multiple accountants. And then it goes back to personal fit. Are they local if you want to meet with them face-to-face? I actually work with an accountant out of Minnesota, so that hasn't been as important, but they are a connection I have through the family. So I think at least we know each other and have that sort of connection, but they are not local, which hasn't been an issue yet. All right. So then transitioning into the next step. So this is where things get real. You've hired your lawyer, you've hired your accountant, um, and it's time to actually file the paperwork to start your company. And so before doing so, we've touched on this a little bit, but just finalizing company details. So figuring out what entity type you want to do, whether it's LLC or S Corp or some of the other options, and then selecting a company name and confirming the availability. I found this to be one of the more challenging steps. I did a lot of research on Google on just, you know, how to choose a company name. So one thing while you're going through this process is thinking about your end goal. Um, If you're planning to expand the company or make it more of something that's going to grow into multiple branches, you might want to be more thoughtful on the name that you have and then also making sure it's available. So I use a website. I started my LLC in Illinois and there's a website where you can check availability I think I probably checked anywhere from like 30 to 40 names and none of them were available. So that was a bit frustrating, but I think it's really critical to think through how you want to name your company. I know, Daniel, you had, so I set up my company with um, the plan just to be an independent consultant, but I know you had some broader goals. Would you mind speaking to your experience for choosing a company name? Yeah. So I would say look for the name and see if it's available in your state. And then from there, look, if you, if you have plans to grow your company, um, check to see if the domain is available. There's a lot of online branding that you're going to need if you have grander plans for your company. And if those names aren't available, you're going to be paying a lot more fees after to buy those domains, or you're going to have to figure out some way to rename your company from an online perspective. So, you know, looking up the Twitter handles, you know, everything, you know, even on LinkedIn, if there's a company already out there called that. Um, There are things that you should probably look into um, in deciding your name, especially if you plan to grow. That's a really good point. Don't start printing out the business cards and the company Mm -hmm. swag before you know if the name's available. And then there's certain requirements too. So you got to, if you're an LLC, you need to actually have LLC in the name. So your lawyer can help you navigate that. But just making sure that it's going to be a fit for your long-term growth 
if you think of Amazon, if they would have included, they originally were focusing on selling books. And if they would have named their company around something related to books, it really wouldn't be conducive to the type of growth that they've seen. So really challenging yourself to think long-term if you want to make it more than just an individual consultant, that's something to consider too as you're picking a company name. So then the next step is actually filing the paperwork. So confirming the names available, um, filing the paperwork, there will be an incorporation fee. I worked with my lawyer to file the paperwork. Daniel, did you do the same or did you work through an accountant? Uh, All the paperwork I submitted through LegalZoom. And then they send you the hard copies after everything's gone through. Perfect. Yeah. And definitely have an organized way of keeping all of the paper that you submitted as well as all of the approved paperwork, because you're going to need that for the next step in the process, as well as opening a bank account. So the next step in the process is filing for an EIN or employer identification number. Um, Again, I worked with my lawyer on this. I would say both filing the paperwork for the company as well as the EIN That took anywhere from three to six weeks for each of them. It really depends on the state and the time of the year. Um, But the the steps certainly take some time, so it's something to factor into your timeline. But that was a pretty straightforward process as well. And that is a good segue into our next one, which is opening a bank account and then ultimately obtaining business insurance. So as we mentioned, you do have to have an EIN to open a bank account. Um, So what I did is I researched a number of different bank accounts. Um, I'm a firm believer in not paying bank fees if you don't need to. So there's a lot of research you can do up front to think about how many transactions are you going to have in a month? Um, Do you need to have ATMs? Do you need to actually be able to go to the bank or can you do everything electronically? Those are a lot of things that factor into the decision. And so I think it's important to do that due diligence ahead of time before actually reaching out to a banker. When you do reach out to them, uh, make sure you ask for all of the documentation you need to provide because there is quite a bit when you actually meet with them face to face. And so you'll end up scheduling an appointment, appointment with them, bringing the paperwork and moving forward with that process. One of the things that I learned, so I, ba- I bank with Chase. And the reason I did that decision is I'm kind of all over the country and Um, moving from time to time. So I wasn't quite sure where it was going to be. So I wanted to pick a national bank. What I've actually learned working with my accountant is that he recommends working with a smaller bank, especially if you need to secure funding. So for example, right now, there's um, that $2 trillion stimulus that the US government is put in place. And if you want to apply for a small business loan, it's a lot easier for a small local bank to prioritize you as opposed to a bank like Chase. So just certain things to consider. I mean, you can't predict everything that's going to happen, but he he recommends to a lot of his clients to actually work with a local bank. So something to keep in mind. They may not have the same fee structures. They may not have as many benefits. So just something to think about as you choose a bank that fits your needs. Other things to think about would be applying for a business credit card, um, a low interest line of credit if you think that might be needed, you know, setting up direct deposits or electronic fund transfers, making sure that they have the systems in place, and the right fee structure for those sort of things, and then depositing your initial investment. So this goes back to figuring out, you know, how much do you need to have in your bank to be operational, accounting for when are you going to have your first contract, what business expenses do you have, um, when will you actually get paid? So making sure you pick an amount that's going to be a good initial investment so you're not transferring money back and forth between your personal and business account more than you need to be. So yeah, so I think that's the main thing, you know, we have some key considerations to look at as you're selecting a bank account, but, um, you know, it's certainly something that you want to do right away. Another thing that I cannot stress enough is ensuring that you maintain a clear delineation between your business and your personal funds. This is really important from a legal perspective. If you're not able to prove that there's not, there's a delineation, then they can consider your personal funds to be part of your business account. And then that can be an issue down the road if there's any audits or any lawsuits. Um, So this is very, very important to have a clear delineation between these two. And then next, so business insurance. Um, This is something that's typically required when engaging with a client. I think typically what we see is up to about a million dollars. And so there's two types of insurance that are commonly used for independent consultants. There's a general liability. And so that protects against third-party claims of Um, defamation and slander, property damage, bodily injury, and other third-party lawsuits, and then professional liability. So protecting against lawsuits claiming professional obligations were not met or there was any sort of judgment errors that were made. And so um, I think a lot of the organizations, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, I think they require professional liability insurance. Some of them may require you to put their name into that liability insurance and then show them proof of that before they would take you on as a consultant. 
I'm not sure exactly what the legal ramifications of that are, uh, but some of them do require that. Gotcha. So yeah, so this is another opportunity to work with your lawyer to make sure that you're setting things up correctly and meeting the requirements, but it's definitely an important thing. And I think it's relatively low cost, anywhere from, you know, depending on the policy, 600 to about a thousand annually, but certainly worth it if you run into any issues down the road. Yeah. So before you move into the operate, which is our part three in in this series, uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the different things that you need to set up to make sure that you can operate. So looking at the checklist, uh, the first thing is getting an email address. So hopefully by this point, you've filed everything, you've gotten your EIN, you have your name, you've got, you've checked to see if the domain address is available. And now you can set up your, your email address that attaches to your company name. From there, you can If your thoughts are growing or you want to really work on your online branding and your marketing, create a website. From there, different tools and applications. Uh, Microsoft Office Suite, I think, is a must. Any clients these days use that from PowerPoint, Excel, Word documents. So having that available. Cloud drives are very great, so you don't have to carry around little hard drives everywhere you go. Uh, Just put in the cloud and it's available to you wherever you are. Uh, Webinar software, uh, that is more optional. Um, I definitely uh, started with that. A WebEx account, um, and then I moved to GoToMeeting, but uh, some clients require that you use their version. So again, it's optional. And then time and expense system. So a lot of our companies that we subcontract under, they have their own time and expense system. Uh, I would say that's more a nice to have, especially if you're just starting out and on your own. You can probably track that by yourself. But we've used uh, applications like Harvest, which is a great software that's out there. I believe they have a free version if you're just one person and one project. So that's something to look into. Um, other things that you might need to, to look into is office space, equipment like a computer. Uh, again, if you just work from home and then go to the client site, that may not be needed. And if you want to build a company page on LinkedIn, Uh, That's, again, optional if you want to grow the branding of your company, Uh, but definitely update your own LinkedIn profile. When you go to client sites, people will always look you up on LinkedIn, so I think it's good to have that updated. And then getting everything, uh, you know, set up with your accountant and lawyer. A few operational assets that we thought were important. So these are things that you can get started on right now so that when you get into operating as an independent consultant, you have these readily available and you're not rushing to get these done. Uh, but one of the one of the first things that you'll need is kind of a sales pitch. Um, so like a one-page consultant biography. Uh, a lot of co- companies that you contract under will request this. So as they're shopping you around for different projects, it's great to have this ready so they can add it to a pitch deck so that they can go to the clients and they can understand who they're um, essentially hiring for the project. In addition, case studies of any projects that you've done um, so that you can always reference those when you're either pitching a new client, or if you're getting the word out there on what your experience is, it's good to reference these uh, from a kind of like a resume perspective. For project delivery, um, having standard status reports, raid logs, you know, all the project management tools that are out there, it's good to have that ready to go. So when you jump on a project, you can start using your assets um, if they aren't available. And it's always nice to have good branding and standard templates so that, you know, you, you kind of give off a sense of professionalism when you get on the client sites. And then finally, operations, understanding if you're doing this manually, having a good budget and forecast. Forecast. Um, there's a lot of burn rate tools. Um, I know when I first started, I did have that in Excel as well, and we may share that in the attachment section. Um, having an invoice ready to go so that when you're billing your client for the first time, you're not scrambling to figure out what an invoice looks like. And then finally, employment contracts, other legal assets. So stuff that you'll be working with your lawyer on. Uh, great to have that ready as well before you start. And these are all things that you can do before you take the jump and become an independent consultant, um, just so it's one less thing to worry about as you get going. Absolutely. I think, yeah, taking the time ahead of time, having it available is definitely beneficial because projects are crazy day, starting from day one. So it's good to hit the ground running with these sort of things. There you go. So that is just an overall high-level setup. And uh, from there, we'll move into part three, which is operate. Uh, but that will be in our next video. So. Thanks everyone for uh, attending and listening in. Thank you.